All right, top 10 sins and struggles. This is lesson number two in the series. Last week we started the countdown based, uh, as I mentioned last week, based on a church survey that measured the uh, congregation's top 10 sins and struggles. And so far our list includes, second time, at number 10, laziness. That was last week. Number nine, coming in at number nine is anger. Anger. So tonight's lesson we're going to deal with this very common experience and potential sin, the sin of anger. So let's start by uh, getting a definition or two about this. <clears throat> so anger, what is it? Well, according to a Cambridge, uh, Cambridge Dictionary, the feeling that people get when something unfair or something painful or bad happens to them. Um, just Google it. If you Google it, uh, the first thing that comes up, uh, anger, a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. Uh, Vocabulary.com tells us an emotional arousal. So all these things is true. It's an emotion, a negative emotion. I don't think people like, like to be angry. It's not like joyful or happy. You know? um, uh, I could go on with more sources, but all of the definitions essentially say the following about anger. Uh, first, that it's an emotion. It's like happiness or like surprise or sadness. It's an, it's an emotion, a strong emotion, uh, usually provoked by some negative event. So it's a strong emotion in us provoked by a negative event. For example, Unfair treatment, we're, we're, we're treated unfairly at work for whatever reason or other. What, what happens, we're, you know, we're riled up, we become angry. Um, humiliation, um, aggression uh, towards ourselves, or perhaps uh, not even towards ourselves, uh, towards uh, you know, uh, people we love, our children. Uh, sometimes you know, we can take an offense against ourselves and you know, let it roll over us, but somebody does that to our child, whoa, that's a whole different story, right? We get, we get angry. Also, it's a strong emotion that can easily lead to other more destructive emotions and behaviors. Uh, we don't always start at resentment. We, we start at anger, but anger easily gets us to resentment. We don't usually start at hatred but anger will find a way to get us to hatred. You get the idea? We don't start at, you know, immediate emotion is not always revenge. Anger is the vehicle that drives us to revenge, violence, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a common emotion. Never met a person who you know, never experienced anger. Common emotion. Everybody gets angry at one time or another. Um, basically, it's the way that we react to negative things, and for many, and here's the hard thing, for many, it's a, a go-to emotion whenever things, big or small, don't go their way. Some people, you know, like emotional, you have your emotional toolbox, some people have only one tool in the box, anger. I mean, it, a lot of it depends on how you were raised and, you know, and some, what was around you and so on and so forth. But some, you know, Hopefully we, we get other types of tools in the box, you know, uh, uh, patience, uh, you know, prudence, uh, whatever. But some people, they just have, they have anger, boom. They just, that's, that's where they go to all the time. Now all by itself, anger is not a bad thing. It's amoral, it's just stirred up emotion. Um, uh, as I've mentioned, it's what anger leads us to that turns an emotion into a sin. So it's, Anger isn't the sin. Anger is the thing that'll drive you to the sin. Um, there are three types of anger recognized by psychologists, psychiatrists, when they're dealing with uh, clients, patients that have anger, quote, issues. One is called hasty or sudden anger. You know, the impulse when one is threatened or harmed physically or psychologically. The reaction of self-preservation sudden hasty anger, you know, fly off the handle, lost my temper, you know. Uh, you do that with kids. Uh, you live near a, a, busy, uh, a busy highway, a busy street, and, and somehow your little guy 
gets out of the backyard somehow, somebody left the gate open and all of a sudden you're in the front doing something, you look out your front window, you're washing the dishes and you see your three-year-old about to cross the, <laughs> across the road. And what do you do? You run out there and do you go, oh, Joshua. <laughs> no, it's Joshua, what are you doing? Have you lost your mind? You know, anger, anger. You're not really angry at them, right? But the anger is just driving you for self-preservation, anger. So hasty, sudden anger, we all experience that. Uh, then there's settled or deliberate anger. Uh, this is when we react to something, when we react to unfair treatment or deliberate harm by another, humiliation. It's like, you know, I'm angry, but it's, uh, hmm, I'm plotting, I'm thinking, you know. Okay, you got in the first shot, but you're in, I'm going to get in the last shot. Yeah, you know, that kind of anger, settled anger, it's in there. It's working, okay? And then dispositional anger. Dispositional anger is when anger is just one of your character traits. <laughs> we know these people, irritable people, grouchy, bad-tempered, you know, they're always mad. Why are you always mad? You know, you're always grouchy, never happy, rah, 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 you know, we know people like that too. What a beautiful day, yeah, sure, it's going to be too hot, you know, all right, whatever. <laughs> There's a term for that, dispositional anger, yeah, it becomes a character trait. So the first two, hasty and settled, the first two are episodic, meaning they happen from time to time in response to outside stimuli. The third one, dispositional, uh, is always present as part of one's character. Um, dispositional anger is not a response to outside events, but it's how a person is despite events. They're always angry. It's just, it's just, it's just boiling there under the surface. So no matter what type of anger or how anger is triggered in you, Anger is sinful when it becomes the fuel to say and do things which are wrong. So you know, when people say, well, I'm such a bad person, I'm angry. Well, no, well, what, has angry, what has anger driven you to? We'll judge that, see if that's sinful. Um, let's have some biblical examples of anger, because I'm not a psychologist, so I'm not going to talk about anger from a psychological perspective. I'm, going to, I'm, a, I'm a Bible teacher, so I'm going to talk about it from a biblical perspective. And there are good images, stories, you know, uh, that teach us about anger in uh, the Bible. First one, I, you think of right away, Cain, right? Cain. Let's read about Cain's anger, what happened. It says, now the man had relations with his wife Eve and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she says, I have gotten a man child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel and Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance, uh, countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if, you do not, and if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. And Cain told Abel, his brother, and it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So note that the anger flared up. Remember, the anger is not the problem. The anger flared up as a result of rejection. He was rejected. God let Cain know that his sacrifice was not acceptable. We don't know how we let him know that, but you know, the Bible tells us in some way Cain became aware that his sacrifice was not acceptable. Again, anger is a legitimate first response to rejection. Your girlfriend that you've been dating for six months says to you, you know, I, this is not working for me. I, I just don't love you. You're a good guy, you're nice, you know, I know you're trying hard and everything, but it's just, the, it's not working, you know? First reaction, anger, well, yeah. Who's happy about being rejected? Nobody. First response. So you know, Cain is not happy about God rejecting his, 
I mean, after all, he made a sacrifice, didn't he? It's not like, he, it's not like God said, hey, you didn't make a sacrifice, I'm, I'm rejected. No, he made a sacrifice too, but his was rejected. So the problem for Cain was how he would respond to this rejection beyond his legitimate moment of anger. So in verses six and seven, we see that God tries to help him kind of sort out his feelings by pointing out the reason for the rejection. It's not like, okay, I'm, I'm not accepting it, boom, you figure it out. No, God, God, God's going to help him along. He points out the reason for the rejection is that he hasn't done well. Cain hasn't done well. There's sin or sins in his life somehow that render his sacrifice unacceptable. God even warns him of the danger awaiting him if he ignores dealing with the sin. Not dealing with the anger. God isn't saying to him, stop being angry, you got to deal with your anger. That's not the sin. He's saying to him, you, you got to deal with the sin because this sin here, this is going to get you into, into trouble. So in his case, Cain, the anger he felt was a sign that there was something wrong in his life, something he needed to deal with. I'll give another example. Sometimes you know, as parents, you're pointing something out to your teenager, you know, something, and they get angry at you. Why? because you're pointing out something that they need to fix. You talk too much. Or you, you know, hey, you know what? You know when all the aunts and uncles came over and the neighbors and you were talking about all of our private personal things about our family? You ought not to, to, to do that. You know, that's, that's indiscreet. First reaction, boh, you know, I didn't do anything wrong. You know, kids are kids don't like being disciplined. But hopefully you know, they'll get over it and then they'll kind of think about it and you'll talk it through and yeah, maybe, that's, maybe, maybe not everybody needs to know all of our private business. Maybe mom's, got a, maybe mom's got a point there. But Cain, of course, he didn't take this advice. He did something else. Okay? He didn't deal with it. And we're never told what the issue was in his life, a lot of speculation, but the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what his issue is. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, John tells us that Cain's actions were evil, but not what they were. Okay? So what we do know is that his anger festered, and it grew into hatred and resentment of his brother Abel, whose sacrifice and conduct was acceptable. So you know, the thing that Cain knew was God was rejecting him, but his brother sacrificed, oh, that was okay, God was happy with him. And so his uncontained anger, left to boil, will soon look for and find a scapegoat upon whom to act out. That's, that's how anger works. Especially if you're the problem and you go into denial and you don't want to accept the idea that you're the problem, well then what happens is, what, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to find out, you're going to find somebody to transfer all of this to. So in Cain's case, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> in Cain's case, God tells him that Cain himself is the cause of the rejection and the reason that he's got this anger in his heart. Again, as I said, unable to accept or acknowledge this, Cain targets his brother as the cause of his rejection and ultimately murders it. It's your fault. If you were in such a goody two-shoes, if you, you, know, you, you think you're better than me, I mean, the story is as old as human history and yet have you never seen that in your own household with your own children? You think you're better than me? Oh yeah, you're such a big shot. Blah, blah, blah. Mom likes you better. <laughs> exactly, exactly what's going on here. So in Cain's case, rejection and discipline, they're the things that cause the anger. There's no sin there yet. But that anger doesn't, doesn't lead him to self-awareness, doesn't lead him to understanding. No, the anger leads him to jealousy. And the jealousy leads him to resentment and the resentment 
leads to murder. So Cain's experience with anger shows us to what degree that anger can move a person to act out. Why do you think Jesus said, you know, if you hate your brother, if you're angry at your brother, you've already killed him? Why? Because being angry at your brother is on the same continuum as killing your brother. Angry at your brother is at the beginning, killing him is at the end, but they're all on the same road. That's, that's, what, he's, that's what he's saying. And Cain is the absolute perfect and clearest example. He was angry. And eventually, without not, not dealing with the anger, not dealing with the issue and the problem in his life, ended up in making things much worse. All right, let's uh, look at another example of anger. Biblical, uh, Moses. Let's read this in Numbers chapter 20. It says then, the, of course, this is, the scene is that they're out in the wilderness. Moses is leading the people. They're, they're out in the wilderness. They've been out in the wilderness for many, many decades. Okay? Almost near the end of their time, actually, uh, of their time in the wilderness. So it says, Then the sons of Israel, the whole congregation, came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed at Kadesh. Now Miriam died there and was buried there. There was no water for the congregation, and they assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. The people thus contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we perished when our brothers perished before the Lord. Why then have you brought the Lord's assembly into this wilderness for us and our beasts to die here? Why have you made us come up from Egypt to bring us into this wretched place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there water to drink. Then Moses and Aaron came in from the presence of the assembly to the doorway of the tent of meeting and fell on their faces then the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, take the rod and you and your brother Aaron assemble the congregation and speak to the rock before their eyes that it may yield its water. You shall thus bring forth water for them out of the rock and get the congregation and their beasts to drink. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord just as he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly before the rock. And he said to them, listen now, you rebels, shall we bring forth water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod, and water came forth abundantly, and the congregation um, uh, and their beasts drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you have not believed me to treat me as holy in the sight of the sons of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Those were the waters of Meribah, because the sons of Israel contended with the Lord and He proved Himself holy among them. So here we see another example of anger and what it can lead to. In this story, the cause of the anger is frustration. He's frustrated. Moses has led these people out of Egypt as God performed miracles among them and through Moses and Aaron, his brother. So God performed miracles, also did miracles through Moses and through Aaron. The Pharaoh, who was hard-hearted, eventually let the people go because of the miraculous plagues that God uh, sent. And these miraculous plagues, they were crippling the country financially and they were demoralizing the population. The king lets them go because he's afraid the people are going to rise up and kill him. So Moses, despite their fear and their complaining and their rebellion and their lack of faith or gratitude, continued leading these people for decades, not months, for decades. At one time, even asking God to take him in order to save the Israelites from God's wrath because of their complaints uh, and their disobedience. Remember, you know, he, he says to God, take me, you know, God's ready to wipe them out. He's, and Moses you know, stands in the breach and he says, no, take me instead. This is how dedicated this man was to these people. So in this particular episode that I've just read, the people once again complain because of a lack of water. And they give in to self-pity asking why has God saved them if it's only to bring them into the desert to die of thirst. Now remember now, this here is happening not like two days when they've just left. This is happening 38 years. They've been in the desert for more than three decades. 
their shoes haven't worn out, they've had food, they've had, you know, God has done miracles among them, the, the cloud, the fiery pillar at night, they've defeated enemies, all kinds of things. You'd think the folks would be getting it by now. And yet, what do they do? They start to whine and complain. Yo, so sad, and God's going to kill us, we need water, we're thirsty. So what, is, what does Moses do, this man of God? He goes to God in prayer to ask for help, and the Lord tells Moses to take the rod, you know, the rod of Aaron, he said, take the rod and go and speak to the rock, there's a, a large rock there, boulder there, where they're at, he says, speak to the rock and water will come forth to provide for the people. Now in verses 9 to 11, what does Moses do? He leaves that scene, he takes the rod, but out of anger, because of his frustration with these people, right, he scolds them. You people, you, I am so fed up of you people. Right? And then what does he do? He strikes the, you know, do I have to bring water out of this rock for you, ungrateful bunch? And he strikes the rock twice with the rod. And of course, the water comes gushing forth, but in doing so, he sins. And sometimes it's kind of difficult to understand, where's the sin here? You know, he tapped, you know, well, here's the sin. First of all, he admonished the people in anger when God gave him no such message for the people. Moses was God's spokesman, right? Sometimes speaking through Aaron, sometimes you know, God would give him commands. He gave him the exact dimensions for the tabernacle. You know, I mean, Moses only spoke to the people concerning what God would, would say. Here, God, he didn't say anything about admonishing the people, telling them this or that. He just said, okay, speak to the rock and the water will come and that problem will be taken care of. But no, Moses is frustrated. He's fed up with these people. So he takes it upon himself to scold them. Then he even says, he even takes a certain amount of credit for himself and says, do, do we have to take water out of this rock? What's this we business? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? So what does he do? He strikes the rock instead of speaking to the rock, which showed his lack of faith. Now in Exodus chapter 17, in a similar situation many, many years before, Moses was told to strike a rock once with a rod and water would come forth miraculously. This is this had happened many years previously. In this instance, he was told simply to speak to the rock. And so the fact that he ignores this command and he goes back to an earlier method to draw water, striking with the rod, shows his doubt. Wait a minute, God said to speak to the rock. Man, that doesn't make any sense, because last time, did I hear correctly? Because last time I went and hit that rock and the water came out. So I'm going to go with what I know. I'm not going to go with what God said, I'm going to go with what I know. And hitting the rock, I know that, the water came out, and you know what, just to be sure, what, what, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to hit it twice. Once and once for luck, right? Something like that. So the fact that he strikes the rock twice shows his further doubt and lack of trust in God's word, which, and here's the real problem, which as a great leader, was a great disrespect of God before the people. You know, you know this story. Every day, men cheat on their wives. It never makes the news. But heaven help the minister of any church <coughs> that happens to run off you know, with one of the members' wives. Okay, that's news. That'll get report. Why? because that man is a spiritual leader, a leader in front of the people, and so on and so forth. So when he messes up, it's news, and everybody will know about it. And of course, the media just loves to report the failings of uh, spiritual leaders, uh, who are, after all, only, only men. But nevertheless, men held up to a higher standard. So it's the same thing, you know? Uh, Moses, a great spiritual leader, held up to a higher standard. 
Now, I don't want to belabor the meanings of how Moses sinned, but rather point out to you the ultimate price that he paid for his sin. After nearly 38 years of leading the people in the wilderness, God tells them, uh, you're not going to go in either. That whole generation died in the desert because of their unfaithfulness and their disobedience, and you're going to join them because of your unfaithfulness and your disobedience. And so if we, if we keep reading this story, soon after this episode, Aaron uh, would die. You know, it starts, Miriam dies, and now Aaron will die. And then Moses is going to spend the next two years preparing Joshua to go into the promised land. And the book of Deuteronomy is written, and so on and so forth. And then he will finally die. So in this case, Moses' case, the anger is caused by frustration. And the, 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 the anger leads to a loss of faith. Notice it's a different track, right, than Cain. Frustration leads to anger, anger, loss of faith, loss of faith, disobedience, disobedience, punishment. You know, why is it important that we instill a sense of faith in children? Because it's very hard to get them to obey, to get the obedience you know, the obedience switch working if, if they don't have faith. Because ultimately down deep inside they're saying, well, why? <laughs> why? If they have no faith, the only one governing their actions are their parents. That's why they obey. You know, I'll get kicked out, I'll get into trouble, I won't get use the car. But once they get to be 18 and on their own, why? My parents are not bossing me around anymore. Why should I obey? Why should I cultivate? Why shouldn't I just do what I want to do? You know, they ask, and I don't want to get too far afield, but in our nation, you know, we're having problems. Why do kids shoot and do that? Well, why? Because there's nothing on the interior that says to them, it's wrong. <laughs> you may lose your soul because of this activity here. There's nobody telling them that. And so Moses pays a high price. All right, another story. One more, one last one, all right. A, a different take this time on anger. David. This is too long to read, we don't have time. But the passage in 1 Samuel 25, as I say, too long, so I'll just summarize the story and it's a familiar one. It's another example of a person experiencing great anger, but in this story we see David avoiding the negative results of his anger and how this happened. Because I know it's, this class is supposed to be how do we deal with the sins and struggles, but I think there's some insights here into this. Uh, in, in this lesson. So this episode takes place before David is crowned king while he and his ragtag army are on the run from Saul. He was anointed by, Saul, uh, by Samuel to be the king, but he hadn't yet been crowned by the people. Okay? So one way that he has of building trust with the people in the countryside is by providing protection for them from roving bands of thieves and foreign soldiers uh, who attack the helpless farmers and people who live in the countryside. They live far from the larger cities. Well, the larger cities are protected by Saul's soldiers, but the little towns and countrysides, and there's no protection for these people. They're, they're just prime targets for roving bands of thieves and so on and so forth uh, to, be, uh, to be robbed. So David begins a kind of a protection for these people in the countryside with his small army. So one such person was Nabal, a rich businessman who owned a lot of livestock. Uh, so what happens is that throughout the year, David's men had protected Nabal, Nabal's uh, shepherds and herders, and at the end of the season, he sends a couple of his men to collect a portion of the flock in return for his service. This was not extortion. He had provided a legitimate service to protect them, and now was coming to get some payment because he had to feed his men. So I want you to just notice Nabal's uh, response to David's men. We'll just read a, sh a short portion here. In 1 Samuel 25, he says, When David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in David's name, then they waited. But, Nabal's answered, uh, David's, uh, but Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are each breaking away from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men whose origin I do not know? 
So David's young men retraced their way and went back and they came and told him, meaning David, according to all these words. <clears throat> David said to his men, each of you gird on his sword. So each man girded on his sword and David also girded on his sword and about 400 men went up behind David while 200 stayed with the baggage, and then in verse 22 it says, uh, David is saying, may God do so to the enemies of David and more also if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belong to him, meaning we're going in, we're going to kill everything that walks and moves and breathes. So, here we see David's anger kindled by, another, uh, by a number of things all at once. Injustice. He was being denied his job. It's, it's like you work all week or all month or three months and the boss said, uh, no paycheck. So injustice. Number two, frustration. His work and effort would not yield anything. You know, where was he supposed to get the supplies that he anticipated for his work? He invested in these people in this countryside here expecting to get supplies for his men. Well now, he wasn't getting any supplies. Well, they had to eat. How are they going to survive? And then thirdly, insult. It's one thing if he says, oh, we had a bad year, we didn't make much, you know, look, would you take a little bit less or take some now, I'll bring some next to it. No, 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 no. It was an insult. Nabal dismissed his claim to the throne, even called him a slave. You know, a lot of slaves are running away from their masters. Who is the son of Jesse? By saying who is the son of Jesse, he's admitting he knows exactly who David is. He knows exactly whose lineage he is. And then when he says, well, a lot of slaves are running away from their masters, that's how he's categorizing him. Yeah, you're, you're a, you were a servant, a soldier under Saul, you've run away, you're starting a rebellion, but he, yeah, no. So there's the insult, okay? No respect. So note that David is immediately consumed by his anger and it leads him to seek revenge right now. He gets the message, he said, all right, let's saddle up. <laughs> it's not, let's have a meeting tonight, let's discuss this among ourselves, perhaps make a proper response, send a delegation, let's appeal to Nabal, get some witness, no, 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 no. Everybody just strap on your sword and let's go, we'll take care of business right now. Uh, you're laughing way too much, Steve, you, I just, I know whose camp you'd be in. So, so the story kind of moves along to show us a new character, Abigail, who is Nabal's wife. She finds out about the situation and what does she do? Well, she prepares the necessary supplies and she races to meet David before he arrives. So let's read just a small part of her appeal to him in 1 Samuel 25. It says, she says, Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil will not be found in you all your days. Should anyone rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. And when the Lord does for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, and appoints you ruler uh, over Israel, this will not cause grief or a troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord having avenged himself. When the Lord deals well with my Lord, then remember your maid servant. Oh boy, oh boy, what a diplomatic, what a wise woman this is. Note how Abigail diffuses the situation. First she apologizes, she takes responsibility. Hey, this is on me, I should have seen this coming, I should have been prepared. Number two, she brings the supplies in an attempt to make things right. He didn't give them to you, but here's what you deserve. Number three, she acknowledges the insult, but she warns David about the consequences that would result in his hasty revenge. In other words, as king, she believes he's going to be king, as king he would have innocent blood on his hands. Not Nabal, that guy, he deserved to die. You know? But what about the shepherds and the herders and the servants in his household? They didn't do anything wrong. But in his anger, David would go in and wipe all these people out. He'd have blood on his hands. So by asking him to remember her when he becomes king, she also acknowledges his uh, true position and she submits to it. Now we know the end of the story, just in case. 
David accepts her gifts. He turns away from his plan. She goes home, she tells her husband what she did and then he dies of a heart attack. Boom, he just drops dead of a heart attack. And then David marries the rich widow and his food supply problem is taken care of once and for all. We always see the romantic side. Oh, he marries Abigail, so beautiful, a happy ending. You know, and they forget, wait a minute, this is a rich widow. <laughs> all the stuff that Nabal had, she inherits. And so he takes her as wife. And it's funny, in the next verse it says, and then these other two women, he took them as wives as well. But she was probably the wisest of the bunch. So the story of David and Abigail shows how quickly sudden anger and an immediate response to it can lead to disaster. Think about road rage. One minute you're driving to work. Next minute you're screaming death threats to a stranger who insulted you with his driving habits. Right, Donnie. Um, and, and, and heaven help you if you or the other guy has a gun in the car. How many times, and we smile and we laugh and it's kind of crazy and goofy, but how many times have we heard about two guys, two idiots, you know, getting mad at each other because somebody cut them off or something, they pull out a gun and shoot them or kill them, you know, lives ruined. Why? Because the sudden rage of anger uh, that, that crept up. So this story here actually, uh, David and uh, Abigail, it provides some good lessons about what to do when you're provoked to anger because we cannot eliminate anger from our lives. There is always going to be situations that cause anger in us, but when that happens, and that's my number one idea for you, do not try to eliminate anger in your life. That's the wrong, you're expending energy for nothing. You're always going to experience anger. But here, here are some things to do when for whatever reason you have provoked to be angry. Number one, pray. Note that David, the man of God, did not pray or seek God's counsel before strapping on his sword. Didn't do it. He just, boom, he exploded, went into action. Didn't stop for a moment and say, Lord, you know, I thought you were providing Nabal and I thought you were providing through him. What's happened? And our prayer shouldn't be to ask God to take away our anger. God, I'm mad, so Lord, please take away. No. Our prayer should be to seek wisdom and understanding as to the why. Why am I angry? Why am I so mad about this? What's going on? Help me, Lord, to avoid a foolish or sinful response to my anger. You know, sometimes God is using your own anger, like Cain, for example, to get your attention about something. You know, he kind of, you're water and he just comes along and goes and stirs you up because you're just a bumping along, minding your own business in your spiritual life. Maybe he's trying to get your attention about something. Sometimes your anger is a sign of something else. It's a sign of fatigue or weakness or misunderstanding like Moses. Or sometimes it's a temptation to lead you into sin. Don't you think Satan uses our own anger against us? Especially if you're, especially if you're a person who easily gets angry. It's like you know, shooting fish in a barrel for the evil one. Are you kidding? Let's go see so-and-so. He gets angry. Watch this. And sometimes we don't destroy someone else, but sometimes in our anger, we will take the Lord's name in vain. Right? The Lord we pray to and love and hope in because of a moment of foolish anger, out of our mouths will come something that we will regret. So prayer helps us to see past the emotion to the cause. Asking God, why am I angry, often takes the fuel out of the fire. Number two, slow down. Anger usually causes us to act or react quickly, to say or to do things that we often regret. So slowing down helps us to get control of ourselves. You know, it was a good thing that David had a day's ride to get over to Nabal's place. Because could you imagine if they were like camped right next door to him? Oh boy. It would have been a massacre. I'm almost done, hang in. Slow down. 
I found that when possible, I will give something that angered me 24 hours to cool off. And I usually see things more clearly. I'll, I'll give it to you another way. If something has made me angry, I, I make a deal with myself. I'll say, I am so ticked off right at this moment, but you know what? I think I'm just going to, I'm going to wait till tomorrow this time to see how I feel. How's this anger feel inside of me? You can't avoid anger, but you can avoid allowing it to create problems if you put a day between the beginning of your anger and the beginning of your response. Number three, most important, stop churning. <laughs> stop churning. If you've prayed, not about the anger, but about the cause, and basically have asked God to help you deal with the offense, whatever it was, frustration, injustice, insult, then let it go. Stop churning. You know, churning, you know what I mean? Churning, you churn butter, right? You churn butter and ice cream, and you keep stirring it up and stirring it up and stirring it up. Well, that's what we do with our anger. We keep stirring it up and stirring it up. And so once you've identified the issue or the person or the thing that has caused the anger and decided to respond, hopefully with kindness or perhaps not at all, or with an explanation, whatever, stop churning the situation over and over and over again in your mind. Worse still, stop churning it with other people. Stop adding flavor to it. Did I tell you what happened to me yesterday? No? Listen to this. Really? Yeah, oh, I was so too. Well, I'd be mad too. Now we're both mad. <laughs> what is that? That that just, what I just explained? That's churning. That's churning and that's adding a flavor. Let's make this a twist cone here. You know what I'm saying? I know this is very difficult, but churning is what keeps the fire of anger burning inside of you. Anger is an emotional prison, and the only way out is to let the fire die out by stopping to churn the details in our mind. Let me go over the insult one more time. You know, let, me, let, let me slow it down in slow-mo. <laughs> yeah, churning. I, I, I even say that to myself. You know, it starts to twirl, it starts to turn, and I'll say, stop churning. Stop churning. You know, self-talk, stop doing that. Paul says, be angry and sin not. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, Ephesians 4, 26. Paul says that you can be angry without sinning if you do not prolong your anger beyond its time. That's what, don't let the sun go down on you. It doesn't mean you have to stop being angry before sundown. It just means anger has a set time. Give it its time, but don't give it any more than its time, okay? It's normal to be angry at times, but don't let it go on beyond its normal time. To do so will lead to hatred and violence and revenge and resentment. You know, my favorite passage to deal with offenses and unkindness and unfairness that stirs anger is Proverbs 19.11. <clears throat> I would encourage you to memorize it. A man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. It is to a man's glory, it is to a woman's glory to overlook an offense. And then finally, one last one very quickly, be your best Christian self. You know, little bracelets there, you know, what would Jesus do? I'd, I'd get one that says B-Y-B-C-S, be your best Christian self. The hard part about dealing with anger is how do I react to the thing that made me angry in the first place? We could spend a long time on this, but the short answer is be your best Christian self. A reaction to an insult, be your best Christian self. A reaction to unfairness, be your best Christian self. A reaction to frustration and waste and incompetence, be your best. What is my best Christian self? What does that look like? So I found that whatever sin that is at my door, revealed or prompted by anger, I never have gotten into trouble and often have resolved the issue when I tried to respond by being my best Christian self. All right, so that's a little bit of info. It certainly doesn't cover the whole waterfront on anger, but hopefully you got a few tips there, a few things to help 
with that issue. We continue next week, number eight, which I will let you know next week. Thank you very much.